speaking today with David Holmgren, who I credit as the true author, inventor, divisor, initiator of permaculture, but who is in a complicated relationship, you've called it, David, with your professor, Bill Mollison, who got title credit. On many issues, we actually uh, weren't so uh, far apart in, in our sort of, uh, you know, uh, basic views, but there were some differences that Bill Mollison tended to emphasize the, the creative response side of permaculture to the limits to growth uh, conundrum about how, you know, the, the problem is the solution and that there is no limit to the potential yields from integrated biological systems. Whereas I intended to be the, the hard case and emphasize the, the hard physical, biophysical <laughs> limits to growth, that there was no free lunch. Yes. Uh, so obviously, um, apart from him being, uh, you know, a great publicist and uh, very much into that sort of uh, populist approach, the message he was giving was was an easier one for people to digest than uh, the message that I've I've tended to give. But clearly, there are important truths in both those perspectives yes. that I've uh, ad addressed in, in in later essays. Yeah, but uh, as I as you've said, and as I've discovered. Uh, it's very hard for people to swallow the uh, the uh, s severity and urgency of the situation we're in today, no less back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the the dominant culture wants us to keep, I keep these, the dominant culture wants us to keep our rose-colored glasses on and see that everything's going to be fine if only this or that. Um, and it ain't so. And if, if you, it doesn't take much to look around the world and see that, uh, that we are uh, courting disaster. Yes, well, I think, you know, I'm, I mentioned the Limits to Growth Report of 1972, which I still date as the most important scientific report in the world, because rather than focusing in on the detailed mechanisms, it didn't even mention directly climate change or peak oil or any p particular limit. He just looked at a macro sense of the, the limits of resources and the limits of sinks where we send all the pollution, the unwanted outputs of systems, and uh, did the macro modeling that showed that uh, human civilization would reach some sort of combination of limits uh, sometime in the early to mid 21st century. The graph is the date, 1900, 1940, 1980, 2020, right down to 2060. Now, each of these lines of, of, of letters represents a curve showing some aspect of the condition of the planet. The further out this way they go, the greater that figure is, the further this way, uh, the less. For example, P represents population. So here it is at 1900, and then it comes up to 1940, it starts to take off. Here we are at 1980, up to the turn of the century, and then it starts to peter off. Let's now have a look at this next curve, the Q curve, which is the quality of life. And this is represented by, for example, the amount of space people have, the uh, amount of money they have to spend, the amount of food they have to eat. Now, it increases rapidly, up to 1940, but from 1940 on, the quality of life diminishes. And here we are about the turn of the century and we come up to the year 2020 and it's really come right back. More people, of course, means that you start to chew up your supply of natural resources. And this is this curve here, the end curve. And it shows that slowly but steadily, the pool of natural wealth in the world, natural resources, minerals, oil, and so on, is slowly but steadily diminishing. So this is the situation. As population increases, the quality of life decreases, and the supply of natural resources decreases. But have a look at this curve here. This is called the Z curve, and it represents pop uh, pollution. Now, predictably enough, as 
the population increases up to 1980, pollution increases. There's more rubbish. But from 1980 to the year 2020, pollution really takes off. This is assuming, of course, that we don't do anything about it. So the year 2020, the condition of the planet be starts to become highly critical. And if we don't do anything about it, this is what's going to happen. The quality of life is going to go right back to practically zero. Pollution is going to become so serious, right out here, that it will start to kill people. So the population will diminish. Right back here, less than it was in the year 1900. And at this stage, round about the year 2040, 2050, civilized life as we know it on this planet will cease to exist. And here we are. And uh, that is that has been remarkably uh, true. And I think it's it was much more fundamental than any of the IPCC reports into the the details of you know the mechanisms by which we are actually facing particular. Um, albeit, you know, perhaps the uh, greatest uh, limit in climate disruption. Well, the, uh, I'm glad you mentioned IPCC because I like to bring in the fact that the IPCC, whose collaborating scientists, economists, social scientists are probably all well-intentioned, are hobbled by a couple of things. One, the rules that were set up under which they work. For instance, that Anything they use has to be within the public peer reviewed science for at least two years. Well, it takes two years to get the funding and do the work and produce the paper and, you know, get it. It's a long process to get a peer reviewed mm -hmm. paper. And that paper has to be in the public domain for two years. And so you get a four year lag, which makes the IPC, IPCC reports four years out of date when they're published. In addition to that, in addition to that, they are hobbled in an inscrutable manner, something we can't look into very much, very well, that the policymakers don't want to hear anything that disagrees with growth. With mm. the, there are no limits to growth. The limits mm. to growth report itself and and uh, the co-authors, two, the, the two living co-authors, I'm in touch with both of them, or how oh, yeah. um, Donella Meadows obviously passed away. May she, mm. may she rest in peace, um, in glory. Um, but her husband, Dennis Meadows, is deeply, deeply not depressed, but uh, disillusioned with how that humanity hasn't gotten it. And uh, Jorgen Randers has gone, he's also, you know, he kind of is like resigned rather than disillusioned, but, and, and he does what he can to, to keep the ball rolling, part of the Club of Rome. But um, Club of Rome, who were the, uh, the group who called for that report to be written, uh, I give them great credit. Yes, I've certainly seen that uh, the emergence of permaculture in the 1970s, uh, you know, happened to ride a wave of interest in what today we would call sustainability that was happening uh, primarily a result of the, the sort of evidence uh, around the dependence on fossil fuels that came from the energy crises and huge interest in uh, uh, embodied energy methodologies as alternatives for policymakers to just using money as a metric for everything. And all of these ideas were also associated with uh, the counterculture, the back to the land movement, voluntary simplicity, the rise of interest in organic farming. And I sort of date really the end of that uh, first wave as being uh, initiated by what I call the Thatcherite Reaganite revolution, yeah. which we got in Australia with a human face with the Hawke Keating Labor government actually in 1983. And it was interesting that that election was fought on an environmental issue and environmentalists thought it was the beginning of the, the golden new age in this country, uh, because you literally an environmental issue, the damming of the, 
uh, Franklin River in the Tasmanian wilderness was the uh, issue which uh, the whole election was really about, but it was really the end as the government deregulated the banks and we moved into uh, that era which was characterised by uh, sort of greed is good. And in my analysis of the history, we got a, a second wave which came following the 87 stock market crash and the formation of the IPCC in 1988 and that climate change then became the galvanising issue for the second wave, which led to the Rio Earth Summit, which again, people thought was this is finally the you know, recognition. And again, uh, sort of uh, corporate greenwashing. And by the time you get to Kyoto in 95, uh, 96, um, it's all market-based solutions yep. again. Yep. Whereas uh, Rio was very much uh, through Agenda 21, the recognition that governments and uh, business could not actually deal with the scale of the environmental issues without a whole of society bottom up movement. But that was completely disabled uh, and it was turned back into market solutions. So I sort of see these pulses and waves. It's, it's harder to date the more recent ones as they become more intense. What, what I'll comment about in listening to you, which is very informative to me, is that you're demonstrating now in real time that same permaculture attitude that where you're looking at the, the big picture and the small pictures and the edge phenomenon, because those are some of the base. I've, I, I can't say I've studied permaculture, but I've tried to run my tiny little farmlet. I call it a farmlet, like a hamlet. My tiny, tiny little farmlet property as a permaculture um, where I choose what species I want to add, where I, you know, I know that the, the, the boundaries are the, the biologically richest, where the birds poop their seeds and um, the weeds tend to grow because you can't get in there and manicure. But you have that permaculture attitude, I'll call it, about history. And it's, it's mm. wonderful. I'm, I'm very glad this, this has come into our conversation. So. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, like, uh, for me, uh, following the publication of Permaculture One, my main focus was uh, getting my hands dirty, you know, in my early 20s, grounding myself in the, the practical skills, uh, becoming a, a competent food producer and a competent ecological uh, builder. And I certainly had a reputation in the permaculture movement of being this uh, grounded, quiet, um, uh, sort of peasant farmer, <laughs> if you like. And when uh, my major book in permaculture, Permaculture um, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability was published in 2002, uh, because it sort of broadens a lot of people's scope and understanding of what permaculture was about as, as, as fundamental um, principles for redesigning society uh, to deal with emergent futures, uh, that the abstraction and sort of breadth of that sort of surprised a lot of people. But in fact, I've always been a conceptual thinker, but having my hands in the soil, doing practical things, uh, being the guinea pig of your own ideas, um, and of course the basic ethics of practicing what you preach uh, has always been for me a way of grounding so the head doesn't sort of drift away into the clouds. Um, I mean we could spend a whole hour on talking about permaculture and where it's gone and where it's going but I regard that as one response. I don't talk about solutions to our current problems because that implies putting toothpaste back in the tube too far gone for that. But it's one of the ways that human habitation might find niches of survival if we encounter, and many would say, I sometimes say, if and when that it's coming, we encounter a collapse of the mainstream. Um, because 
uh, growth economics, as you've pointed out, cannot go on forever, as we all know. I like the quote from Kenneth Boulding, um, the only people who can believe that in infinite growth on a finite planet are either uh, crazy or economists. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and he's talking about, of course, neoclassical growth economists who don't, mm. they can't afford to recognize the limits to growth. So I wanted to move our conversation a little bit towards um, your view of the current situation and um, how we should be moving in order to soften the impact that we're headed towards with Gaia, with the, uh, the, mm. the resources and sinks, waste sinks of the planet. Mm. Well, I, I suppose the, uh, beginning in the late 90s, I started uh, coming back to those issues of, of fundamental limits and reviewing our understandings and misunderstandings around those issues. And, and started to see that of all the different limits, the, uh, the two uh, great ones were the, uh, the climate um, uh, acceleration and uh, the peaking of uh, the world's supply of its most important energy source in transportation, um, liquid fuels, and primarily from uh, the peak and decline of what's called conventional oil, the really high quality uh, oil that the world economy depended on. And I, I put that together in a, a small book, uh, Future Scenarios, which was uh, um, published initially online. It's, it, it's still online as a, a website, but then later uh, in 2009 as a, a small book and suggested four scenarios for not a uh, precipitous uh, complete collapse and extinction of humanity, the more extreme scenarios, which tend to come to the fore as soon as people recognize that the conventional notions of growth are not going to happen. People then tend to default into a full um, if not extinction of humanity, complete uh, and rapid collapse of uh, civilization. Whereas I tended to take the view while acknowledging that there were some systemic drivers in both the natural uh, systems and globalized industrial society that supported the possibility of a precipitous continuous collapse, that some form of energy descent where there is less resources and energy available for each succeeding generation, not in a steady sense, but through crises of what people would experience as collapse, stabilization, and then further ongoing impacts for centuries into the future, at least. And that the best model we had for that in history was one of the best models, uh, best documented of civilization decline or collapse is the decline of the Roman Empire. Now, of course, the time scales over what that happened and its confinement to the broadly the Mediterranean region of the world means that it's not, of course, a model for what we're facing. But at least this concept um, uh, allowed me to shape four scenarios uh, for the medium term in, in terms of the next 40 years or so that I called uh, green tech, brown tech, earth steward and lifeboats. Okay. And I saw those as not choices humanity would make, but more driven by these fundamental drivers of the high quality fossil fuel decline and climate impacts would be primary drivers of which then humans would respond in ways, all sorts of different ways to those basic situations. The net energy return right. from oil, which was of course the historically easy out of the ground oil and still many of the super giant fields of the world, which are still flowing 
in places like Iran and Iraq and Saudi Arabia, which uh, is producing that, not the flurry of liquids that have come from the shale oil industry, which is an example of uh, where we see the massive environmental impact, um, very short term uh, survival of the fields um, and uh, only debt resulting, no actual real continuing profits uh, show that although there are these uh, oil resources in the ground, they are not the sort of resources that will sustain the sort of world we've had in the past because their actual net energy return is very low. And if we did a proper full cost analysis, even without allowing for the greenhouse gas emissions cost, they, they may return some sort of net energy, but they support only a very frugal, completely different sort of society to what we have now. And they leave vast fields of waste in Alberta, and they leave exactly. poisoned water uh, where they've introduced their chemicals in order to force the shale out. You know, they you know. represent the crumbs of the fossil fuel era. And so that distinction, which is very difficult because the stats don't actually distinguish between that conventional oil. It's just there's a figure called total liquids, which includes all sorts of stuff um, that's a byproduct of gas uh, refinery and all sorts of things that can't even be sold on the market as oil, let alone actually represent, uh, you know, the the way we've um, harvested energy in the in the past. Yeah, and it, and there but, there's no that's no accident there. The the data is um, obfuscated by con we're we're confused by the fact that they group things that should not be grouped in order to hide these little details. I like to call them. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You know, mm. still the Wizard of Oz. But it is interesting. I was having debates with colleagues, especially um, Peter Harper from the Centre of Alternative Technology in Wales, uh, when he was out in Australia in the early 2000s. And he was saying, look, we are facing, you know, an extreme climate emergency. You know, we have to consider every mechanism uh, possible to, uh, you know, reduce carbon emissions. And I was saying, look, I think we're going to be hit by the the peak oil crisis, which will uh, crash the global economy and save us from that, that that will happen first. And we were having this debate and then he was in Australia again in 2007 and, and uh, I was acknowledging, you know, the new evidence from the Arctic and uh, whatever. And he was sort of seeing you know, information that he hadn't been aware of before about peak oil. And we were both <laughs> sort of acknowledging these sort of onset, but it, it appears that after the global financial crisis, the, the fact that money was effectively free to the corporations and the fact that the system would just throw all these resources at continuing the apparent supply of transport fuel and build this massive infrastructure to cope with the peak and decline of conventional oil. And yet the climate evidence was actually constantly going to the worst case of any of the conventional projections. So that pushed uh, us into the territory that I describe as brown tech, where we have rapid uh, onset of climate change and a relatively slow decline in the key energy supplies that support humanity. The other thing that's happened with that is, of course, been the uh, while renewables, I don't believe, are some magic alternative uh, to fossil energy, the improvements in renewable energy, at least for the electricity sector, have been faster than what a lot of people uh, in, the, in the field with a lot of knowledge expected. So 
that relatively slow decline in energy, but rapid onset and extreme onset of climate change defines us into the, the brown tech scenario. And basically in an essay in 2013, um, uh, welcome, uh, I called uh, crash on demand, welcome to the brown tech uh, future. I sort of said, it looks like we're, we're heading into that uh, future. And I think certainly I was suggesting for countries like Australia, which of the rich countries in the world is one of the most vulnerable to climate change impacts, um, that uh, seemed to be uh, you know, well on course. Whereas our brothers and sisters across the Tasman in, Tas in New Zealand, for example, um, was a country that the prediction suggested not insulation from climate change, but relatively uh, slower effect of, um, and, and so the different countries could be tipped into these different scenarios. But in doing an early uh, workshop on this subject in uh, 2006, I think uh, in Perth, WA, uh, one of the participants in the course had just come back from working on biofuel projects in India. And he said, all four of your scenarios are unfolding simultaneously in India. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that, of course, not just in different places in the world, but almost simultaneously in the same place, aspects of these uh, four scenarios were um, emerging. And uh, it's... Um, of course, the later work, I started to focus more on the financial mechanisms um, because I saw those as very fast acting, which could trigger changes because money is completely virtual, could trigger some of these changes faster than uh, uh, the actual change in the global climate or depletion. Uh, of resources. And uh, in future scenarios, I mentioned a whole lot of the other confounding issues. And there's a one line mention of uh, global pandemics. <laughs> oh, there we go. And now that's become the headline every day in every newspaper in the world. Yeah, yeah. Whereas that in itself is, um, I saw as a derivative of having a global population of 7 billion people, all hyper-connected, which is a product of globalization and cheap energy and, and the sort of systems we've got. And our encroachment on wild places. Yes. Us so, in contact with, with viruses that, that develop in, in species that are compatible with us in some way. I mean, it's famous that we get all yep. of these Asian flus because they keep fowl, chickens and ducks, right next to pigs, and people sleep with, with their animals in a, in a uh, hammock or something. And they're just, and so you get the avian flus passed to pigs, passed to humans. And, and now there's an, uh, an implication that bats were somewhere along the, uh, the line in producing coronavirus. <laughs>